that book. If you don't, you're going to be missing uh, some information that you need to have. So uh, I encourage you to do that. Uh, it's... Like I say, it's, the longer I read it, the tougher I found it to be, and yet um, I was so glad that I did read it. Last Sunday and New Year's Eve, <laughs> I, I had a message prepared for New Year's Eve, and um, what were there, six or eight of us who were here, and that's all right, I'm, that's not a complaint, I'm just saying, so I thought, okay, I really want the church to hear this, this message, so I'm going to preach it again Sunday morning, and I told them New Year's Eve night that they'd probably hear it again the following Sunday morning. Well, we only had 16 last Sunday morning, I'm not preaching it again, all right? But it's, I, I want to share some of it with you this morning, signs of the times that, that we're living in, in these last days. Uh, and the coming of God's judgment, it, it's upon us. It is very near. And we need to be aware of this. And so I want to share with you just the scriptures. I'm not going to go into detail, but the scriptures that I shared last Sunday, uh, last Sunday morning. So if you'll just follow along with me as we read through this, it'll lead into where I'm going as well today. Second Timothy chapter 3, and you may know these verses uh, very well. I've put some, some additions. Of, of definitions in the middle of this. But it says this, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. How many believe we're living in the last days? Yeah. It's getting more difficult every day. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, meaning braggarts or empty pretenders, arrogant, proud, showing oneself above others, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, which means to be profane, unloving, and that doesn't mean loving strangers, it's talking about unloving, the word in the Greek means not having family love one for another, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, to a form of devoutness to God, although they have denied its power. And that word power there is dunamis, which is talking about miraculous power. So having a form of devoutness and godliness, but denying the power of it and avoid such men as these. If that doesn't paint a picture of the times that we are in today, the signs of the times that we're in, I, I don't know what else can. Scripture goes on to say in Luke 21, it says, but when these things have begun to take place, straighten up, lift up your head, for your redemption is drawing near. It doesn't say, am I having trouble? I'm not got anything here. When these things begin to take place, straighten up, lift your up your head. Don't cower down, don't go hide in a corner, but be prepared because the redemption of your soul is at hand. And then finally, in 2 Peter chapter 3, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, and, and Peter's writing about the very end of everything, he says, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming day of God, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, the elements will melt with intense heat, but according to his promise we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwell. Therefore beloved, since you are looking for these things be diligent to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless and regard the patience of the Lord to be salvation. That's what we just read about. Your kindness leads leads us to redemption, or leads us to, to repentance. Your mercy leads us past judgment. 
Regard the patience of the Lord to be salvation, just as also our beloved Paul, according to his promises, has written this. So today we want to we want to talk about this coming day of the Lord just a little bit more. And I want to read to you a passage of scripture that I find to be very challenging, very it's one of those passages you read it and you think, wow, what does that mean? It's found in Genesis chapter 15, verses 12 through 16. And this is Abraham as God is about to, to instill upon him the great covenant that God gives to Abraham. That he's going to be the father of, of many children and father of nations and, and all these things. But he's making this covenant today, cutting covenant with, with Abraham. And it says in chapter 15, verse 12, now when the son was going down a deep sleep fell upon Abram or Abraham and behold terror and great darkness fell upon him he was having a nightmare and God said to Abraham know for certain that your descendants will be stranger in a land that is not theirs where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years so he's telling them telling Abraham about their going into Egypt we know about that we're past it we're looking back he's promising them you your descendants are going to go and be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Verse 14, but I will also judge that nation whom they will serve, and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. And we remember that when they came out of Egypt, they came, the Egyptians gave them gold and silver and all kinds of precious things. They were happy to see them leave. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they shall return here where Abraham was at, the promised land, what today we would call Israel. They will return here. Then here is the statement. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. That phrase has always caught my attention. The iniquity of the Amorite. Now, the Amorites were the people who lived in Israel at that time. And it wasn't just the Amorites. That was a term that meant all those who lived in that area. And their sin, their iniquity, was not yet complete. We'll look at what those sins were in just a moment. But I first want us to understand... This incompletion of sin, this measurement. You see what God is saying? I'm measuring their sin and they haven't filled up the measure yet. But the measure for what? What, what do you mean? The measure of sin. The measure for judgment. God was saying judgment is going to come on them, but I'm giving them time. The Lord is not slow about his promises, but is patient toward us. Why? Because he is not willing that any should perish. God didn't want to see the Amorites be destroyed. God wanted to see the Amorites repent and come to him. But that's not what they did. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9, I just quoted to you, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient. So aren't you glad for the patience of God in your life? I know I am in my life. Goodness gracious. I am so glad for God's patience. He is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But... The day of the Lord will come like a thief. When does the thief come? When you least expect him. <laughs> I'm reminded of this summer when you're gone out of town for a week and you leave your key in your suburban. That's when the thief comes. When you least expect him. He doesn't come and announce, hey, I'll be here tomorrow. I'm coming next week. When you least expect him. God is, is not slow about fulfilling his promise of judgment. I'm so thankful that when God revealed himself to, to Moses there on that mountainside that day, he says about himself, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, abounding in mercy. But he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. The measure of iniquity of the Amorites was not yet complete. Judgment will come for 
us as human beings, it will come at the end of our life. We don't stand in judgment today as individuals. Amen? Amen. God's judgment comes at the end. What does the Bible say? It's appointed unto man wants to die. And then comes the judgment. That's scripture. It is appointed unto man to die one time. Not many times over as some, some religions believe. Reincarnation. You die once. And then you stand before God and give an account for your life. That's for human beings. That's for us. But it will not be for, that way for nations. Nations. The Amorite nation. The people as a whole. The people. People of Canaan and different ones throughout history. Nations are judged in this world. Now I want you to grab this because it's important for you to understand scripture. We are judged after this life. You have till the last day you breathe your, your last breath to repent and come to God. The scary part about that, and I should give you a warning, that day of the Lord, that day will come when you least expect it. Quite possibly. You know, it's wonderful when you, when you know your death is coming, you've been given that sentence of death, whether by cause of health things, or, or maybe you've been in an accident, you know that death is on its way, but many times it comes just like that. I've stood and preached funerals for baby infants. Thankfully, they are innocent. They go into the presence of the Lord. They haven't reached the age of accounting, but the hardest sermon I ever preached Probably was for an 18-year-old girl who had been in my youth group for many years. She's very precious to me. In fact, she, she lived with us for a few short days. She'd had trouble at home. She had to get out of the home. She came and lived with us for a few days, maybe a week. I don't remember how long. And then she went to live with family in Iowa. That was when she was about 15, I think, maybe something like that. Several years later, she was 18. It was the last day of school, if I remember right. She was graduating in the next few days, going to the graduation ceremony. She was leaving school, got hit by a dump truck, and was killed. You know not the day. She stood before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, she had been a Christian when she was in our youth group. She had been loving the Lord, and I, and I hope that's where she ended up. But I don't know because I wasn't around in the last few years. But it just always reminds us that we think we've got a long length of time when we never know. We will face the end. We will face the judgment in the end. But nations face judgment in this day and age. Right where we, at, where we are at. So God says to the Amorites, the, the fullness, the completeness of their iniquity has not yet been completed. In other words, God was saying, I'm giving them more time. Let me show you another passage that kind of goes along with that. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 31 to 33, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he's kind of rebuking them. He's not kind of, he is rebuking them and talking with them. And he says this in these three verses. He says, so, test, so you testify against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. There were those who had murdered prophets in days gone by. They were claiming to be descendants of those men and women. Not taking pride in murdering prophets, but being proud that they were descendants of Abraham. Jesus then says, fill up then the measure of the guilt of your father. There's again that idea of measuring sin. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sins of hell? Listen to this in the Amplified Bible. It says, thus you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's sins to the brim so that nothing may be wanting to a full measure. God measures our sin. God gives us time. But there is a place where God says no more. That's far enough. That's as far as it will go. Another passage in Daniel chapter 8 verse 23. As Daniel is seeing the prophecy of the end times. And this is talking about the coming of the Antichrist. He says this. And in the latter period of their rule. When the transgressors have run their course. A king will arise insolent and skilled and intrigued. Listen again to this in the Amplified. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors, the apostate Jews, have reached the fullness of their wickedness, taxing the limits of God's mercy, 
a king of fear, fierce countenance and understanding dark trickery and craftiness will stand up. What God is saying is nations will be judged. Nations will give an account. They will receive their punishment or their reward while still in this time period, this place. So I say all this to ask this question. Has God's patience run out for the United States of America? Has God's patience? You know, we're living in some incredible times. I mean, every day you turn on the news and it's like, wow, where did that come from? I mean, how many of us expected the, the Capitol building to be broke into and, and shots fired inside the Capitol building and people to be in the Senate chambers and in the House chambers and stealing things? And I mean, we would have never guessed such a thing would ever happen. Who would have guessed that, that such allegations have been made, would have been made about an election in the United States of America being so foul and so stolen or whatever? We, we have no evidence, proof that's been given of that, but yet it, it seems to be the accusations. Who would have ever thought that? We are living in some incredible times. Is God's judgment beginning to descend upon our nation? Have we filled up the full measure of sin? Have we ran out God's patience as a nation? I'm not sure I can accurately answer that question because none of us knows the mind of God. But I want to go back and look at what was the iniquity of the Amorites that God would say they have not yet filled up the, the, the measure of their iniquity. <coughs> Let's see if we can gain some clues about what the iniquity of the Amorites was. Now, this is a long reading. I want to read you the, the, the chapter of 18 of Leviticus. And I know all of you are thinking, Leviticus, oh my goodness. But uh, I, I want you to listen closely to what this says. And before I begin reading it, you may be following along in your King James Bible, which is fine, well, and good. But in the King James, there is a phrase that you'll see over and over again in this chapter. It's uncover her or his nakedness. To uncover their nakedness. Nakedness. That was a Jewish idiom, a Hebrew idiom, that literally meant to have sexual relationships. It wasn't just exposing, it was to have sexual relationships. And that's how they said it, that's how it's literally written in the, in the original language. The, I'm reading from a modern translation that will say it differently, but it, it means the exact same thing. I, I wanted to clarify that to you. So beginning in verse 1, Leviticus chapter 18, it says... The Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. I am the Lord your God. So do not act like the people in Egypt where you used to live or like the people of Canaan where I'm taking you. So don't act like the Egyptians, don't act like the Amorites. You must not imitate their way of life. You must obey all my regulations and be careful to obey my decrees, for I am the Lord your God. If you obey my decrees and my regulations, you will find life through them. And that's what we need to know more than anything else. God's word is life. I am the Lord. You must never have sexual relations with a close relative, for I am the Lord. Do not violate your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. You must not have sexual relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with any of your father's wives, for this would violate your father. Do not have sexual relations with your sister or half-sister, whether she is your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in your household or someone else's. Do not have sexual relations with your granddaughter, whether she is your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, for this would violate your son. I know some of you are thinking, goodness gracious, but just follow. Do not have sexual relations with your stepsister, the daughter of one of your father's wives, for she is your sister. Do not have sexual relations with your father's sister, for she is your father's close relative. Do not have sexual relations with your mother's sister, for she is your mother's close relative. Do not violate your uncle, your father's brother, by having sexual relations 
relations with his wife, for she is your aunt. Do not have sexual relations with your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife, so you must not have sexual relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife, for this would violate your brother. Do not have sexual relationships with a woman and her daughter. Do not have, do not take her granddaughter, whether her son's daughter or daughter's daughter, and have sexual relations with her. They are close relatives, and this would be a wicked act. While your life is, wife is living, do not marry her sister and have sexual relations with her, for they would be rivals. Do not have sexual relations with a woman during her period of menstrual impurity. Do not defile yourself by having sexual intercourse with your neighbor's wife. Do not permit any of your children to be offered as a sacrifice to Molech, for you must not bring shame on the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not practice homosexuality, having sex with another man as with a woman. It is a detestable sin. A man must not define himself by having sex with an animal. And a woman must not offer herself to a male animal to have intercourse with it. This is a perverse act. Do not defile yourself in any of these ways. Listen. For the people I am driving out before you have defiled themselves in all these ways. Because the entire land has become defiled, I am punishing the people who live there. I will cause the land to vomit them out. You must obey all my decrees and regulations. You must not commit any of these detestable sins. This applies both to the native born Israelite and to the foreigners living among you. All these detestable activities are practiced by the people, excuse me, all the people uh, of the land where I am taking you. And this is how the land has become defiled. So do not defile the land and give it a reason to vomit you out as it will vomit out the people who live there now. Whoever commits any of these detestable sins will be cut off from the community of Israel. So obey my instructions and do not defile yourselves by committing any of these detestable practices that are were committed by the people who were, have lived in the land before you. I am the Lord your God. I wanted to read all that to you because it sounds, it's just like over and over repeating, but it's making clear all this, the, the sins of the Amorites could be wrapped up in, in two real easy sentences. They're statements. Sexual immorality and the shedding of innocent blood, which you may have missed. The one statement in there is said, talking about offering their babies to Molech as sacrifices. In other places, the Bible calls that the shedding of innocent blood. Two simple statements. Now I want to take you to another passage of Scripture. Again, this is somewhat long. It's there on the screen. You can follow. This is Manasseh. The king, one of the kings of Israel, in fact, I believe to be the most wicked king that ever lived in Israel. 2 Kings chapter 21, if you're following along, 2 Kings chapter 21. And this talks about the reign of Manasseh. Listen carefully to what this says. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hephzibah. I'm sorry for her for that reason. He did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abomination, listen, of the nations whom the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. The high places were the places of idolatry. And he elected, erected altars for Baal and made an Asherah. And Asherah was a female deity. It was a wooden like a totem pole, to be exactly right. It was like a totem pole with a figure of a female deity on it. She was considered the, the goddess of, of um, fertility. She was worshipped through sexual immorality. By, by in practicing sexual immorality, that was how you worshipped her. So he says, he erected altars for Baal and made an Asherah as Ahab king of Israel had done, done and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served him. He built altars in the house of the Lord of which the Lord had said, in Jerusalem I will put my name. For he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He made his son pass through the fire. Now what that literally means, this god Moloch, this, this idol, 
was a huge idol and at its stomach it had a, a large extended area where they could build a fire down in, in its stomach. It had a place there for a fire pit and they would literally take their babies and toss them into the fire as a sacrifice to God or a sacrifice to Molech. Pass through the fire. I see faces going, what? Yes, that's exactly what they did. The shedding of innocent blood. For he built the altars of the host of heaven, two courts, house Lord. He made his sons pass through the fire, practiced witchcraft and used divination and dealt with mediums and spirits. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Then he set the carved image of the Asherah that he had made in the house which the Lord had said to David and to his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. So he eliminated the name of God in the, in the house of God and he brought in the Asherah. And I will not make the feet of Israel wander anymore from the land which I gave their fathers, if only they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them, and according to the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they did not listen, and Manasseh seduced them to do evil more than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the sons of Israel. Now the Lord spoke to his servant the prophet, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done all these abominations, having done more wickedly than all the Amorites did who were before him. And he has also made Judah sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am bringing such calamity on Jerusalem and Judah. Notice the nations, the cities, the peoples of Jerusalem and Judah, that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet, uh, plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I will abandon the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hands of their enemies, and they will become as plunder and spoil to all their enemies, because they have done evil in my sight and been provoking me to anger since the day their fathers came from Egypt, even to this day." Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood until he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other. Besides his sins which he had made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. It is amazing to me the great sin that Israel sinned. The sexual immorality, the shedding of innocent blood, just like the nations who had driven them out. And we see that God brought judgment upon those nations. And listen to me today. I ask you this question. Is God bringing judgment on America? I don't know how we can see anything but that taking place. When we see the same sins taking place in our nation today that took place back then. How can America not come under God's judgment and God's punishment? Today I would tell you that it's not God who is abandoning America. It is America that is abandoning God. We have run him out of the schools. Back in 1963, they, they literally outlawed the reading of the Bible and the prayer led by teachers in school. I, a student can still do it somewhat on their own, even those students, I hear of it all the time, who are being told they can't read their Bible or they can't pray privately themselves in schools. It is happening. We've ran them out of, ran God out of our public schools. We've ran God out of our public square. We try to do everything we can to eliminate the, the idea of God within our nation. Homosexuality and sexual sins of all shapes, sizes, colors. I don't know what's how you want to describe it. It is going on and made public and made normal in our nation. Can anybody say amen? Do you hear what I'm saying? If, if, if God judged the Amorites, if God judged Israel, how can he not judge us today? I believe that God's judgment is falling. And I'm, I'm not saying God's judgment is upon individuals, upon you or upon me as individuals, but upon a nation. 
I believe that we're beginning to see the fall of our nation. I'm not saying that to, to scare you. I'm trying to say that to warn you. We need to be aware. We need to be alert. The Lord's coming is drawing very, very near today. He is right at the door, I believe, and we need to be prepared. How can we be prepared for the destruction of our nation, for the coming of the Lord? Number one, I would say to you, do not be in panic and fear. Do not be in panic and fear. God is with us. Did he not promise? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you. If we are children of God, if you are a born again child of God, you are in God's hands. He will protect you. He will keep you. That is not to say that you'll not endure hard times perhaps. In fact, Jesus declared in this world you will have tribulation, stress, trouble, trials. You will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome you can overcome. So I tell you, first of all, don't panic, don't live in fear. Secondly, I would tell you to be prepared to be used of God. In a time of great stress, great struggle, great problems that our nation has seen, is seeing, and I believe is going to continue to see worsening, when people see peace in our own lives, in our lives as the children of God, what a greater time to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Amen? What a greater time to be a witness for Jesus Christ. God has a purpose. We must remember that God has called us to seek his kingdom first, not our kingdom. The Lord has really scolded me this week as I've been preparing this message, as I've been getting it ready, reminding me, America may come or go, America may fall or, and not stand anymore, but I'm still with you. Are you serving me or are you serving the United States of America? God first. God first, above my own pleasures, above my own desires, above my own prosperity, God first. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, first and foremost. So, number one, do not panic, do not fear. Be available for God's purposes. The third one there, Cody, I've lost notes on my, on my, my laptop for some reason. Be prepared. I don't know what's coming. I'm not here to give you a prophetic utterance about what's coming down the line. I don't know what's coming, but we need to be prepared, people. Financially, physically, uh, spiritually, emotionally, we need to be prepared. We need to be ready for the day of the Lord. Things are, I believe, I, and this is my personal feeling, things are gonna get more difficult as we go. If you've got debt, I would suggest you get out of debt quickly, as quickly as you can. I'm saying that to myself. If you don't have things laid up, prepared, I would suggest you begin to stock up and prepare. And I'm not trying to be doomsday. I'm just trying to say God gives us warning for a purpose. God doesn't speak to us and warn us for no reason whatsoever. But especially and above all, be spiritually prepared. The coming day of the Lord will come like a thief in the day that you least expect it. Are you ready to stand before the Lord and give an account for your life? Nation will have to give an accounting and God is doing that I believe right now. I believe God is calling our nation into an account of the things that she has done over the last number of years. In the 58 years I've lived, I cannot explain to you my feelings. What I 